What's happening, everybody? I'm Steve, and welcome back to Junk Drummer TV, where I give my initial reactions, my hot takes, and my analysis on the drummers of today and yesterday, and maybe tomorrow if I stick around that long. I'm a professional drum teacher and a gigging musician, and I have been for the last 20 years. Well, this is the first video in a post-Neil Peart world, so let's all drown our sorrows by watching one of the all-time greats play drums. Before I get into it, I'd like to give a shout out to my first three patrons on my Patreon. Thank you, Ryan Copeland, Jumbo Mills, and Paul Ryan. I wonder if that's the same Paul Ryan that used to be a congressman. It's probably not. But thank you all very much. And if anyone is uh, interested in my Patreon, I do have a link in the description. So today's episode completes my Mount Rushmore of jazz drummers. I've done Buddy Rich. I've done Art Blakey. I've done Tony Williams. Please go check those out. But today we end with that. And I'll be doing more jazz drummers later on. But this is the fourth guy on my Mount Rushmore of jazz drummers. Mr. Elvin Jones. So after you watch this video, go please check out the Tony Williams video that I did. At the very beginning of it, I talk about my journey and how I became a jazz fan while I was in college. But after I discovered Tony Williams, you know, he was the one that really turned me on to jazz. I really became a big listener and I was trying to get all of it. And here's my story of how I found Elvin Jones. I bought a Love Supreme on cassette tape, and me and my girlfriend at the time, we were going to the Redneck Riviera. If you know where the Redneck Riviera is, then you have a good idea of right around where I'm from. And the girlfriend was getting off work, and I was going to have to make the whole drive. So I said to myself, while she's asleep, I'm going to listen to a Love Supreme, and I'd never heard John Coltrane. Uh, okay, no, I'd, I'd heard John Coltrane with Miles Davis, but I'd never heard John Coltrane by himself, and I'd never listened to Elvin Jones. And I was going to do this while she was sleeping, because her favorite band was the Dave Matthews Band and Bare Naked Ladies, and she hated what she called that music without words that I always played around the house. So I'm driving to the Redneck Riviera, I put on a Love Supreme, and I have no clue what's going on. I'd never heard music like this. I'd heard a lot of jazz up until that point, but I'd never heard anything so abstract and so avant-garde before. This is way before I found Eric Dolphy, so this was off the charts for me. I had no idea what I was listening to. I didn't know if I liked it. I didn't know if I loved it. I didn't even know what it was, but I kept listening to it, and I kept listening to it, and I kept listening to it. Did the vacation. On the way back, of course, she sleeps the whole way, and I listen to that record again over and over and over on this drive. And somewhere along the line, on the way back from the Redneck Riviera, I got it. I got it. I was, and it was, it was a mind-expanding event. The way that Elvin Jones plays is unlike any other drummer in recorded history. And I think that's the big takeaway of why jazz music is not really popular anymore. It's not in vogue. The only people who listen to jazz music are, you know, uh, jazz musicians in college. And rich people who take vacations to the Bahamas for jazz festivals. In today's microwave culture, if you don't get a piece of content right off the bat, we tend to just be like, nah, none for me, and throw it away. And when you do that, you're missing out on something that could be an enriching experience to your life. And that's what it was for me with John Coltrane and Elvin Jones. So before we get into it, please feel free to like, comment, and share. Check out my Patreon, link in the description. I also have a PayPal account. And please subscribe and hit that notification bell. And one more thing, please stick around because in the middle of this video, I'm going to tell a very funny story about a license plate. It'll make sense later. So let's get into it. Of course, this is Afro Blue. This is one of my all-time favorite standards. This is in 6-8. And playing jazz in 6-8 gives you a lot of choices to make decisions that you don't have when you're playing in 4-4. Four -four. You notice right here, He's playing it almost like a hard waltz. He's hitting that hi-hat. Okay, so before he was playing that hi-hat on the two, three, two, three. During the head, Elvin is playing almost like a Mozambique. It's, it's the first movement of a Love Supreme is similar to what he's playing here. You know, if this is your first time, yes, yes, I love, I love that, I love that, I do that. I did that last Wednesday at a gig I played. 
where he he does this big floor tom roll and it almost kind of sounds like a timpani thing and does this big crash into it we got to watch that again i love that oh i love that so much and he does that to set up this piano solo yeah boy oh, i love elvin no one plays like him McCoy Tyner's left hand is from outer space. His left hand is alien. And Elvin Jones played a lot off of McCoy's left hand. You know, I want to preface all of this. I am a junior varsity jazz player. Uh, I almost uh, fear doing these videos because I'm not a high-level jazz player, but I am a high-level jazz uh, appreciator. I don't know if appreciator is a word. You know, anytime you're in an acoustic situation like this, the piano solo, you have to come down. You gotta bring the volume down, even if the piano's mic'd. You know, the big thing that I think Elvin did, I think Max Roach did it as well, was he, he freed up the hi-hat and kept it away from just that two and four. And then he started using that hi-hat in his comps. And and because he wasn't such a, you know, when you think about the jazz, you know, pattern, that hi-hat, that two and four, just, it, you know, it, it, it solidifies the beat. And by Elvin and Max, I'm gonna have to do a video on Max too, freeing up that hi-hat he was able to float over the time because he was not anchored to that two and four yeah those little right left left right left left that he's doing in there mm, i love it you know picking up that piano solo you know if you're not a jazz player or listener this probably sounds like insanity to you what you're hearing, what you're hearing right now is a high level musical conversation. This is not drums as a foundation piece. It's drums playing like this, interplay. I firmly believe that when you play jazz music, oh God, that left hand. <laughs> I usually listen to his left hand more than I do his lead lines in his right hand. I don't know if McCoy Tyner gets enough love. Everybody always talks about Herbie Hancock. Man, nobody played like him either. There are thick thick chords being played there and just being punctuated yeah even in jazz you have to introduce the next uh, soloist you know what we're doing here is we're, we're playing choruses and it's not like a chorus in rock music you know uh, a jazz standard is set up with what we call the head which is the melody of the song and then you solo over what we call choruses in jazz music and if you notice right there he still hit a big old crash symbol. i don't think he did it on the one i think he did it on a syncopated note before the one but there it was he was introducing mr coltrane on soprano saxophone you know he's known as a tenor player Yeah, when you're playing in 6-8, you're not tied to the spang, spang-a-lang, spang-a-lang jazz pattern. Elvin brought in a lot of the Afro-Cuban rolling triplet feel. And a lot of people think that John Bonham got the Bonham triplet feel from Elvin. And he was a big Elvin fan. dropping those bombs like a bebop drummer but he wasn't a bebop drummer he was the next step oh my god Ugh. 
McCoy Tyner is kicking John Coltrane's ass right there. <laughs> yes, yes. White boy behind the piano, he knows. Bringing the head back. You know, that's the, the main melody of this song. This is the B section of the of the the head. That's where you have your composition that you can play around with on drums. It's so disrespectful to stop John Coltrane, I know. But I did tell you I was going to tell this story. So, uh, the first uh, car that I had after college, you know, I went through when I went in, when I went into college or be, in college, I became just a, a jazz fanatic, one of those just, you know, self righteous music school nerd jazz fans, and I couldn't wait to let everyone know that I was a cultured white boy and loved Elvin Jones. So I got a license plate that said Elvin Fan on it. I still have it. It's in my studio. It's in one of my studios. And I was just so proud. I was like, man, I'm going to let everyone know, see how cultured I am. I know Elvin Jones and I'm a fan. Well, I got that license plate at right around the time the Lord of the Rings movies came out. So for two or three years while I had that pickup truck, no one asked me, hey man, are you an Elvin fan? Are you an Elvin? Like, do you know jazz? No. Everyone was like, which Elvish species is your favorite? No, I love Lord of the Rings, but I didn't, I didn't even think about the correlation between the two. So two, for two or three years, I had a pickup truck that looked like I was just the biggest Lord of the Rings fans. And I am. I've read all those books. But that was not what I was trying to get across. I wanted everyone to know that I was, I was smart and intelligent and I knew jazz music. And it backfired. Yeah, there's that. It's, it's He's playing kind of a Mozambique, which is an Afro-Cuban beat. It's one of those world rhythms that drummers should be able to play, if not for the performance of it, but for the, the coordination that it gives you. They were so more wide open than the Miles Davis quintet, you know, the Tony quintet. And this was right before the quintet, that quintet got together. It's a 65, I think. They're exploring right here. You know, they've played the head, they've played courses, they've played the head again, and they just they're just going now. You're seeing true exploration of your instruments live on TV with no net. He loved these big cadenzas at the end of songs, especially live. Elvin, God, I love the way he plays drums. So, yeah, man, Elvin Jones, McCoy Tyner, Jimmy, Gar Jimmy Garrison, and John Coltrane. Uh, I love it, man. Uh, you know, not a lot of people watch these videos, the jazz videos that I do, and I don't give a shit. Uh, I said to myself when I started this channel that I wasn't going to chase views. I was going to do things that I thought was valuable and things that would be a resource to people and things that would hopefully uh, uh, turn people on to things that they haven't seen before. So I don't care if this, none of my jazz videos have done well, but I'm going to keep doing them because I think it's a, it's valuable. It's a valuable music. You know, it's, it's pretty much like gone 
gone. I mean, I know there's tons of jazz recordings released every year. I know the jazz magazines are still out there, but as a as a viable part of the zeitgeist, you know, jazz is gone, uh, and I and that sucks. And I really think it's because. Going back to that original story of me uh, really getting into a love supreme, it's not, it's not an easy thing. You're just going if you aren't ready to take that kind of exploration, this kind of, you know, avant-garde uh, kind of music, you may need to listen to it a few times to get it. You know, it's not a jingle. You know, you hear that, hear that pop jingle on the, you know, that's what I call pop songs. You know, that jingle on the radio and you know that chorus right off the bat and you can sing it by the second chorus. It's not that. You have to, you got to take some time. You got to listen. You got to, you got to free your mind. You got to, you got to uh, surrender to the experience of something that you're not necessarily used to. And I think if more people were able to do that, I think jazz would come back again, but it's not looking like that anytime soon. So, if y'all enjoyed all that, please give me a like, comment, and share. Give me a double tap on the subscription and the notification bell. Uh, remember, uh, check out my Patreon and my PayPal uh, in the uh, link in the description. And remember, keep practicing until it's easy.